And you, you should move a, a bit over there with all your equipment because you otherwise you fall yeah. off the picture. <laughs> you don't want me in the picture anyway. Oh, we won. Okay, let me get quicker here, make sure this works. Hey, it works. All right, so uh, my name is Jared Smith. I'm the Fedora Project Leader. Um, I wanted to, to share a talk with you that I've given at, at a couple other conferences, um, specifically about how, you know, what is the purpose of a, a Linux distribution? How do they help upstream communities? And why is it important that they, they work well with upstream communities? Um, it's not a super technical talk. You've probably heard all the things that I'm going to present here um, today before. And a lot of it's just common sense. But I wanted to, to take the time to share some of the insights, some of the, some of the things I've found in working with, with free and open source software over the past several years. And hopefully present it in a way that, that kind of gets, catches your attention, um, helps you think about some of these things as you go through them. Um, before I start with the, kind of the technical meat of my talk, though, I want to give you just a, a brief introduction to who I am. Anybody who know who I am? I think there's probably three or four people in the room who know who I am, and everybody else is like, who is this Joe? Yeah. So I want to well, spend just a, 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 a few seconds giving an introduction to who I am. Um, my name is Jared Smith, like I said. Um, I'm the Fedora Project Leader. Um, one of the things that I, that I truly believe is that people tend to um, be kind of a sum of all their experiences in life, and, and their experiences in life really make them who they are. And so I want to give you a little bit about my background. Um, I grew up in the western part of the United States, um, near uh, a, large, a large national park we have called Yellowstone National Park, near the, the Grand Teton Mountains. A uh, very beautiful place to live, but uh, it's also a very cold place to live. Um, <laughs> this is what nine months of the, uh, of the year look like. Um, we always tell the joke that we only have three seasons. It's last winter, this winter, the next winter. <laughs> And much of the United States looks like this right now after this big snowstorm that came across the United States. So um, that, that was where I grew up. Um, there was always those two or three weeks during the summer um, that, we, that we actually you know, saw, saw beautiful weather. And I always loved to, to go down to the river. Um, there was a little river that came through my town. And uh, I would spend every day during the summer at the river. Well, I was either fishing in the river, or I was floating down the river, or I was swimming in the river. But I just loved to spend time down at the river. And I want to use this idea of a, of a river as kind of an analogy as I go through this uh, talk today to talk about working with upstream. Well, here's a, here's a river or a stream, and we want to talk about upstream. Um, and I love to fish. I don't get the opportunity to do much fishing now. I, I seem to be too busy. But growing up, especially as a, as a child, I loved to fish. And when I was about, oh, probably 11 years old, 12 years old, somewhere around there. My father took me, my brother and I took us to the ocean and we got to go salmon fishing out in the ocean. Now what do you know about salmon? Anybody here ever gone salmon fishing? No. Anybody here eat salmon? Yeah. Okay. So one of the interesting things about salmon is that they oftentimes live a lot of their life out in the ocean except when it's time to spawn. And then they will travel upstream. They'll swim all the way upstream and go against the current to be able to go and spawn. And then they go back out to the sea. And then they die. Or, and die. And sometimes they die before they get it back out to sea. So they, spend, they go to all this effort to get upstream. And then it's like, ah, I'm done. I'm dead. So why do they go to that effort? Why do they spend all that time and energy and really the, the, the end of their life pushing so hard against the current. To reproduce. To reproduce. That's, that's an important reason, I guess. And any other reasons? Instinct. Instinct? Because it's the right thing to do? They couldn't spawn in the ocean? Better, lots, better, lots, lots of technical reasons. Better environment for a, a, a better environment. And so I want to use this, again, as sort of an analogy of why, why do we want, you know, distributions to push changes upstream. Why work closer with the upstream communities? Is it easy? No? Is it easy for that salmon to, to, to swim upstream? No? And then you know, humans come along and put things in the way to make it even, even more complicated. But, uh, but it is worth it. It's, 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 it's instinct. It's, it's a better environment. I think that, that all contributes to, to why we work with upstream. 
So anyway, a little, little more about myself. Uh, once I you know, grew up and left town, I went, went to the university, um, studied electrical engineering. I found that as I was going through my electrical engineering studies that I became a lot more interested in, in kind of the, the, the software side of it, the, the, the software side of things. Um, so I, I spent a lot of time working on, on computers and computer systems. Okay, I'm not quite that old. <laughs> but I, I, I you know, have, have a lot of interesting experiences. Um, but I think the, the life-changing experience for me was a Unix class that I had in the university. And you know, that's where I learned to use VI. Really learned to use my fingers and found, and found an editor that could keep up with my brain. Um, and. Uh, and that really kind of kind of opened my eyes to hey, there's there's a different way of doing things, and there are these small tools that you can learn, and then you can chain these tools together to create something bigger. And and for me, it was an absolute eye opener because I, I decided right then and there I said I don't want to build circuits for the rest of my life. I want to I want to be a Unix geek. <laughs> um, a couple of years later, a friend introduced me to Linux, and that was that was a dream come true. So. So that was that was kind of how I got started. Um, after I finished up with the university, did a number of jobs. Did some. Uh, I was a database administrator, programmer. Um, got into the systems administration side of things. Managed uh, about 6,500 servers for a, for a large uh, web analytics company in the United States. And that's really where I learned that okay, it's it's interesting and fun to set up a Linux server and then run some services. It's a whole different ball of wax to actually go and set up large systems that have to communicate and have to maintain uptime and failover and, uh, and these sorts of things. And so there's, there's, there's a set of skills that come from not just being able to set up a server once, but maintain that server and, and, and everything over a lifetime. And so some, some, some lessons to be learned there, and I'll share some of those. Um, did that for a number of years um, and got really interested in uh, voice over IP and telephony. Um, uh, wrote, uh, co wrote the, one of the books on Asterisk, which is the open source telephony engine you've probably heard about. Um, co wrote the O'Reilly book on that. Mm -hmm. uh, got into the documentation on that side, then really kind of dove in and, and learned telephony and, and, and voice over IP and uh, eventually worked at Digium. A couple of guys in the audience here are, are from Digium as well. And uh, ha had a lot of fun in, in that space. And then uh, this past uh, summer, um, Red Hat made me an offer I couldn't refuse, and that was to become the Thor Project Lead. Mm -hmm. I, I still haven't quite figured out that they tricked me into wanting the job, or did I somehow trick them into thinking I was the right guy for the job? I haven't quite figured that out yet, but I uh, um, really enjoy being the, the, the Fedora project leader. Um, I've been a long time yeah, Fedora user um, ever since it split off of Red Hat, um, a long, long time um, RPM packager and that sort of thing. So, so it was a, it was a, it was a natural fit. Um, I want to share some of the experiences that, uh, that not over just the past six months as the Fedora project leader, but you know, in, in, in my longer open source career um, about software development and how that happens. So I want to start off with where does software start? Does most software get started by committee? Does innovation happen, happen in a conference room? No, not usually, right? It's usually somebody has a great idea and they said, hmm, I wonder, and they start coding, right? So code usually starts out as just a little trickle, usually one person, maybe two people working together, um, and then it, then it forms into larger communities. So let's take this little, this little spring right here. Let's say you know, a, a river starts somewhere, right? It starts at this little spring. So software just like that starts with one, one person, maybe two people. Maybe two, two or three people come together and then join a couple of projects to, 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 to make a bigger project. And pretty soon you build a community around that piece of software. So what is a community? If I were to put a picture of a community up here on the, on the projector, is that a community? <laughs> or is that just a bunch of houses? Maybe. And is there a difference? Somebody, somebody had an answer out there. What's, what's the difference between a bunch of houses that live, you know, that have to be next to each other? A relationship, the people. And a community. A relationship, the people. Maybe some shared goals, some common interests. Um, so about, what about software communities? Is there a difference between people that happen to be working on the, on the same piece of software and a software community? It's the infrastructure. 
Maybe maybe some infrastructure, maybe some relationships, maybe some shared goals or common interests. Um, I, I love the quote uh, that, that Linus Torvalds gave about community. Somebody once asked him, a, a journalist asked him, so what's the state of the, the, the Linux community? And he said, Linux community? There's a bunch of people using Linux for their own selfish interests. I don't know if there's a, a community per se. Now, I like that quote for a couple of different reasons. One, because you know he's kind of half half joking that you know there, there is obviously the Linux community, but it shows that people are using the, the software really for for their own self interest much of the time, and that's okay. That's not necessarily a bad thing. I have a, a slightly different definition of uh, of community, especially when we're talking about a, a software community. Though. And I like to think of, of of software communities as a table. It's a table where different people with different backgrounds, different experiences, different goals can come down, sit together, and have a conversation. Share ideas, bounce ideas off of each other, sometimes have some healthy discussion. Um, and that's, that, that's a very good thing. Now, sometimes we get into these bike shedding arguments of what color should the table be, and should, should we paint it green, or should we paint it red? And we've talked more about the, the table itself and the process of the table itself rather than the, than the software we came to discuss. But community is a table. We all bring our own set of experiences, our own, our own background, our own skills to that table. But hopefully, when we leave the table, we've learned something and we've made, made the world a better place. All right. So what do software you know, communities typically do? Well, they build some software, and that gets bundled up and put into some sort of distribution. So what is a distribution? It's not a trick question. What's a distribution? It's a bundling. It's, it's a CD or DVD that comes out every so often, maybe every six months or every year or every 18 months, or, right? For six years. For six years. <laughs> That's, okay. That's okay too. Or continuously. Or continuously. Maybe there's not. You know, maybe maybe they don't cut a, a, a new version every six months, but it's a continual, continual updating process. Okay. So is a distribution just just a collection of <coughs> software? How is that organized? How is it? Integration as well. There's, there's integration as well. So typically, most most Linux distributions, but not all, have some sort of concept of a package, right? There are these little building blocks of software, and they often integrate with each other and, and kind of plug into each other. So I like the analogy of using Lego blocks as packages. Anybody here like to play with Lego blocks? I absolutely love Lego. Um, I probably spend more money on Lego than I spend on, on uh, computer hardware, <laughs> which is sick and wrong. Difference. The, the, these things happen. Now, do you see the Lego blocks as being a distribution, or the company Lego producing Lego blocks as a distribution? Well, I, I see. I, I, I look just as the building. These are being building blocks that kind of stick together and can, can form a distribution out of out of individual packages. Um, Hopefully, it's not a distribution. It's more than just a set of packages. Hopefully, a distribution might be um, a set of cohesive packages that fit together, and there's some, some there's some integration work that makes them that work well together. And maybe there's even a community that forms up around the integration of these packages together into building a set that's not just a generic set of packages, but packages that fit together and work well together and and, and play nice. That's what I see a, a, a distribution really as being. Does that make sense? The, 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 each, each, each individual building block might be a particular package. Maybe it's Qmail, or maybe it's Exim, or maybe it's Postfix. It's also about documentation. It's about uh, guiding information to users. So, so, so when, I buy a, when, I, when I buy a set of Lego blocks, am I buying just the blocks? No, I'm getting the package. I'm getting the blocks. I'm getting some, some, some instructions on, on how to put the pieces together. I'm getting some nice marketing that, oh, this is what it looks like when you're, when you're done and you, and you put it all together. Um, so you're paying for more than just the plastic blocks. You're really paying for the, the experience. And I think that's, that's really where distribution shine, is the ability to take these different packages, put them together, put some, some, some nice window dressing on them, write some documentation, provide a, a better out-of-the-box experience than just trying to roll, roll your own from scratch. That makes sense? 
So when we're talking about you know, both distributions and, and, and you know, free software in general, we typically you know, use this analogy that I started out with of a river, right? We have upstream and downstream. Everybody familiar with that? For those who may not be familiar with that, let me just, just review those. First of all, we have the idea of upstream. So upstream, the further you are upstream, the closer you are to the authors or the maintainers of that code. If you're integrated into that upstream environment, the more influence you might have on that particular package or that particular piece of software, right? If you're one of the core authors, you have a lot more leeway to change the future direction of that software package than if you're just an end user downstream. The downstream users have to have less influence on, on what happens in that software. Does that make sense? So we have upstream and we have <coughs> downstream. Now, there's several different, you know, several different ways of looking at this, and there, there are certainly people who would say, I don't care about being upstream, I just, gonna, I just want to be downstream, I want to play in my own little sandbox, I'm going to do things my way. Um, I think that over the past five or six years, we've seen a shift towards distributions being more willing and more eager to, to work with upstream communities, and, and when they make changes, try to push those back upstream. And certainly in Fedora, we've tried very, very hard to, to kind of you know, change things that way. When Fedora first started out, we used to carry a lot of fat, patches in our packages that we weren't even going to bother to try to push upstream. That's, you know, that's too much work. It's too hard. They don't want the patches anyway. And uh, I think we've learned over the past several years that that, was the, that, that really wasn't the, the, the wisest approach to doing that. And so we've tried to change things to where we push things aggressively <coughs> upstream as much as possible to try to carry as few of our own custom patches. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as, as we go through here. Um, so uh, I, I want to point out just from the from, from the Fedora standpoint that that you know we see Fedora as as being you know this gal on the kayak up here, um, you know kind of kind of closer to to, to upstream. Um, and then, it, you know, further down the stream, we have Red Hat Enterprise and some of the derivatives of Red Hat Enterprise. Because of where we are in the stream of Fedora, it gives us a chance to see what's, what are the newest technologies that are coming along, have a chance to, to play with them, see how they work, um, really be, be on, on the cutting edge of, of new features and, and new integration work that's happening in, in the next. At the same time, we can then have other people kind of follow, follow along behind us, see what, what works well in Fedora. And then they can choose, oh, yeah, that worked really well in Fedora. We should take a look at that. And, oh, yeah, that wasn't quite ready for Fedora. Maybe we should hold off with this. That's really cool. so, so we like to be you know, a little closer to the, to the cutting edge, a little closer to upstream, and maybe some other um, more enterprise-like distributions. Um, so what do distributions really give besides this packaging and integration piece to software? Um, I've got a lot of different things that uh, that, that I think about when I, when I personally think of, of, of Linux distributions and what they do um, and why, why they're unique. Um, the first one is a, is a sense of vision. Um, it's easy to say, well, I want this package and this package and this package and this package. But most of the distributions have some overarching um, vision or, or goals or well, you know, bug number one type, type motivation behind their, their distribution. Why does that distribution exist? Why is it different? than another distribution. And so I think distributions um, you know, exist to, 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 to fulfill a goal, to reach some, you know, to, to serve some mission in life. Um, obviously, you know, different distributions have, have you know, a, a different goal, and that's OK. I think that's a very healthy thing. Um, I think the, the world would be a very boring place if everybody thought exactly like that. And so it's nice that we have different distributions. They're able to focus on different things and, and still move free software forward in, in an efficient manner. Um, another thing that I think sometimes we underestimate within the, the free and open source community is giving people a chance to, to participate in, in something that's bigger than themselves. Um, people take pride in what they do in, in open source software. How many people here have packaged something in open source or written some documentation or, or helped out, show, showed a friend how to use open source? How many people take pride in that? I certainly do. And I think too often we kind of skip past the, the pride piece and say, oh, people do it for altruistic reasons. Yeah, they do too. But sometimes it's just to, to take pride in something that, uh, that I've helped create that's, that's bigger than myself. So you know, I think that's an important part 
um, of the free software experience and the part that distributions really play a role in. I know that if I get this package in the Fedora, or if I push this patch in the Fedora, or work with Upstream to get this, this software packaged in Fedora, I know that, hey, that CD is going to come out in six months, and you know, I help build that. That's pretty cool. So uh, pride, is, pride is, a, is, is something we do in, in distribution. Get some, you know, build something that people can be proud of. The next thing that we do is try to build communities. We try to try to you know, reach out to people and, and give them a place where they feel comfortable, where they feel welcome, where they feel like their input is valued, or their suggestions are, are listened to. And there's discussion on the technical merits, yes or no, should we take this, you know, take this path or should we do this thing? But we try to build, just like this little town of Ardmore, Oklahoma, um, we try to build inclusive communities. <laughs> we try to reach out to people from a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different countries, a lot of different languages, a lot of different experiences, um, and build you know, communities that are, that are very inclusive. So I think maybe, maybe if, if, if I could be critical for a minute here, maybe some, sometimes we're not inclusive enough within the open source communities. Um, maybe we could reach out to people who aren't necessarily packagers or developers or hardcore geeks. And, uh, and reach out to, 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 to the average Joe on the street who just wants an operating system that works. And, and it doesn't necessarily need the technical details of how do I set up a mail transport agent. <laughs> just a thought. Um, obviously, distributions exist because they bring a set of tools to the table that people like to use. All right? You get your compiler, and you get your web browser, and you get your, you know, the tools you use to do whatever it is that, that you do. In, in this case, you know, somebody, somebody. This is a, a photo from a guy who, who likes to upgrade electric guitars. And he's got his little tools here that, that he uses every time he up, upgrades it. I think many of us use Linux because he gives us the tools, the exact tools we need to do whatever it is we enjoy doing. Whether it's writing software, whether it's writing documentation, whether it's packaging, whether it's um, building. You know, building servers, whether it's being a systems administrator, whatever it is you do, you know, the operating system should give you those, those tools. Another part of the, the whole open source experience um, is really that of a, of a school. Um, how many here do everything about Linux three or four or five years ago and you haven't learned anything since? Uh, not even one person raised their hand. That's good. That means we're all growing, we're all evolving, we're all um, better than we were yesterday, or the day before yesterday. And what's one of the things I absolutely loved when I started with Unix and then got into Linux is there was so much to learn, but there were so many people willing to take my hand and help me learn them. And, yeah, there was a few of those lessons I had to learn you know, repeatedly and, and, and as a hard way, as, as I was kind of you know, stubborn at times. But let's not underestimate the, the power of, of you know, we all have something that we can share. We all have something that we can learn. Um, I love the saying that says that none of us is as smart as all of us, because it really, you know, it really typifies, you know, how, how open source communities work together to help everybody get up to speed on, on a particular topic. I don't think there's a, per a single person in this room that knows everything there is to know about Linux or open source or free software. Sorry. <laughs> But that, that means we have a great opportunity to, to help be a schoolhouse, to help people learn um, the things that we, we, we know how to share. Another thing I love about, uh, about free and open, open source software communities is the opportunity for cross-pollination. You know, there's people here with a lot of different backgrounds, with a lot of different knowledge, and I'm sure if I said, hey, I need some help with uh, programming a microcontroller, there's probably three or four or five people in this room here that know a heck of a lot more about programming microcontrollers than I'll ever know. Or if I say, hey, I need it, I have a question about voice over IP, or I have a question about firewalls. I mean, there are people in this room that, that, that are experts, and there's some great opportunities, especially at conferences like this, for cross-pollination, for collaboration, for saying, hey, I was thinking about doing this, and somebody says, oh, you know, there's this other project that did this, and this is what they learned, or, or that sort of thing. There's tremendous opportunities to, 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 to rub shoulders with people you may not ordinarily meet, and you may not ordinarily be able to sh share information. And so that's one of the reasons I love to come to conferences like this, and really get to meet different people with different experiences and different backgrounds. 
obviously a big part of what the Linux distributions as well is, is communication. Um, lots and lots of different mailing lists, lots and lots of different forums, um, lots of different kind of cubby holes of, of knowledge. Um, Again, not, not to be too critical, but if, 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 if I had to take a step back, maybe we have too many, too, too many different little compartments for the knowledge and, and not easy way, ways to share them either between, between distributions or between different um, communities, between you know, different, different software. Um, there's a lot of knowledge out there, but sometimes trying to find the right cubbyhole where that knowledge has been stuffed, or maybe, maybe it hasn't been documented. Maybe it's, go read the source code and there's your documentation. Um, <laughs> Obviously, this, this whole communication and documentation piece is, is a critical thing for, for Linux distributions to, to work on. Um, another thing that, uh, that I love about open source communities is the, the idea of transparency, that things aren't done in secret, things aren't done in a black box. Um, I can't tell you how many times as a, when, I, you know, when I was in the university and setting to be an electrical engineer, you were handed a data sheet and said, here's this black box, here's how it's supposed to work. Just, just assume that it's going to work like that, and, and, and you'll be okay. That always drove me crazy. I wanted to tear it out open and see what was inside. Why does it, why does it work that way, or why isn't it working like it, like it says it should? Um, and that's really, you know, the, the idea of, of transparency and openness that, that we're all, you know, sort of on camera, we're all, on, you know, under, you know, on radar, so to speak, is is an interesting, an interesting topic. But it, but it certainly, it certainly helps for building trust in a community, building openness in a community, um, building those relationships with the other people that you associate with within a community, um, that helps. Um, without trust in a community, you're not going to get very far. So transparency really, really is the key that I see to, to building trust within, our, within a community. Um, now, another part, for, for, for better or for worse, um, People, you know, distributions give people a soapbox to stand on and, and preach their particular version of, of you know, you know, dare I say the word open source religion. Um, it, it does give people an outlet to, to share, share their ideas, share their concerns, share their, you know, their, their crazy, crazy stories, crazy ideas. Um, and yes, this can be taken to an extreme. Um, sometimes this is a very healthy thing, and sometimes this is just watching sausage being made. Um, sometimes it's a, a little unhealthy. I, I'm personally of the opinion that as long as we can act like adults, as long as we can treat people civilly, that good, healthy discussion is, is a wonderful thing. And it's what sets us apart from other software development models. Um, obviously, there's a good side and a bad side to that. I think sometimes we're, we're our own worst enemy that way as well. I think we tend to tear people down and publicly um, way too often. And, and you know, when we do give praise, usually it's in private and it's, it's pretty quiet. Um, so I think, I think there's some, some opportunities, obviously, there, there for improvement. Um, but the good thing is that this is all a work in progress, right? Anybody here run the perfect Linux distribution and you're never going to have to upgrade again? Okay, good. That means there's room for improvement. I'm, I'm a big fan of continual improvement and, and process. Um, as long as you're better today than you were yesterday and you're better tomorrow than you are today, you're headed in the right direction. And so there's lots of work we can do. No Linux distribution is perfect. No piece of software is perfect. At least I don't think so. Unless it's like one line of code. But, no significant piece of software is, is, is perfect yet. We need to keep working. We need to keep improving. That's why Fedora keeps shipping a new set of CD images every six months. Or that's why you know, people keep updating packages or writing new software. You know? We have a tremendous opportunity to make the world a better place. I think it's human nature to kind of overestimate the short-term change and kind of under underestimate the long-term change. Um, as, as, as you go you know, changing the world, so to speak. Um, I remember when I first got connected to the internet, and people were saying, oh, you're going to be able to buy books online, and you're going to be able to, to find all this information, and everything will be free. And I think I kind of overestimated just the short term, you know, what was going to happen, and totally underestimated the long term. You know, how many of us would be totally lost if we didn't have an internet connection, at least some, sometime during the day? 
<laughs> 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there's no way, there's no way I would have imagined that we would have been so plugged into the internet that we couldn't even function without it. And I think, again, I think that's, I think that's, that's human nature to, to, to kind of overestimate the short term, underestimate the long term. And so I want, you know, certainly within Fedora, and then I encourage everybody else to take a longer term um, view of, of, of what changes we're making to the world. Are we making the world a better place, or are we just making a, you know, uh, you know more packages or a, you know, sort of thing? One of the one of the things I asked, the questions I asked at, at the Fedora Users and Developers Conference last week is. Are we building a, a bigger distribution or are we building a better distribution? Interesting Thank question. Both. Hopefully both. But that, you know, it's not just about bigger, it's, it's also about better. And so uh, uh, yeah, lots, of, lots of room for, for continual improvement. Now I want to dwell just a second on kind of the negative sides. Um, you know, who is, who is the enemy? Obviously, it's not little Lego guys. I have to put Lego in there one more time. <laughs> who, is, who is our enemy? If you would have asked me 10 years ago, I probably would have said, oh, the enemy is some large software corporation that's, that's going to squash Linux somehow. If you would have asked me five years ago, three years ago, I probably would have said, well, the enemy is that other Linux distribution, right? They're the, they're the ones that are, that are playing fair and you know, they're, trying to, they're, they're trying to squish us. Um, if you were to ask me today, you know, who's, who's, the, who's the enemy of, 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 at least for Fedora, since it's not that huge for Fedora, I would say, well, probably the biggest enemy to Fedora today is probably Fedora itself. Um, I'm much more concerned with, with the way we treat our own communities, with the way we treat the people within our own project. Then, then I am concerned that some large corporation is going to come along and somehow be able to squash it. Um, there's a, there's, a, you know, there, there, there's lots to be talked about there. Um, this is the really a, a lead into my talk tomorrow. Um, tomorrow, um, uh, Stefano from from Debian, uh, Jos from OpenSUSE, and I are leading a panel discussion on collaboration and cooperation and communication between different distributions. And how we can how we can kind of raise the signal to noise ratio there. Um, how we can cooperate where it makes sense and, and agree to disagree where, where it doesn't make sense. So, um, anyway, uh, lead, lead in for that tomorrow. Um, but I do think too many times we build up artificial barriers, um, either for people trying to contribute to our distribution or people trying to get into the, into the open source way of doing things. Um, too many times we say, well, you really want to get to that barn right there, but you can't come through this gate. You have to go around the corner, and you have to sign this piece of paper, and you have to jump through these three hoops, and then maybe you know, we'll talk about it, and then we'll maybe, maybe let you help. I found from, from sad experience that typically the quickest way to get things done in open source communities is to give somebody a, a good goal of, of what, what to accomplish, give them the tools they need, and then stay out of their way and let them go do it. Um, we found that in, in Fedora. It used to be that, that you know, Fedora would build its, its CD images and ship them off to Red Hat, and then Red Hat would go and build the CDs, and it was always a painful process. And we found out, uh, well, it's probably been six or seven years ago, six years ago, um, we found, oh my goodness, it's so much easier if we just tell the community, hey, here's some money, go have the CDs done, just do it. And they did it faster and a better job and better artwork and, and, and the whole nine yards. And so. I've, uh, since then, I've, I've always tried to keep an eye out for what artificial barriers are we putting up in people's way? How are we impeding people from doing the, the, the thing that they want to go do? And try to try to minimize that as much as possible. Um, the last thing that uh, the distributions do, um, or second last thing, I guess, um, the distributions do is give, give people a chance to be creative, to, to tweak a lot of knobs, um, you know. Have, a, have a, a creative outlet that they can that they can go build something and, and see how it works. Now, any any audio engineers in the room? Anybody like audio? There's a couple of people kind of sort of raising their hands. If, if you had a, if you had an audio set up and I just came up to it and started turning all the knobs at once, how would you feel? <laughs> you, you'd be upset, right? And, 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 <laughs> and so, a lot of times, I think that. Uh, that people want to do this with a Linux distribution. They try a new Linux distribution and say, this is really cool, but I want to change this and 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 this. And this. Um, 
And so, you know, I certainly, when I started as the Fedora project leader, people came to me and said, oh, Fedora's totally broken. You've got to change this, this. I'll tweak this knob here, turn this knob over here. The volume's too high over here. Um, I think as a project leader, part of my role is to say, okay, yeah, well, we, we're going to change some things. We're certainly going to mix things up. Nothing's, you know, nothing's chiseled in stone. But we're going to do it in an organized manner. First, we're going to turn this knob and see how that goes. And then we're going to turn this knob and maybe turn this knob over here, too. Um, but to put some order and, and, and some, you know, some process into making sure things are done in an orderly fashion. Um, the last thing that, uh, that distributions really do is give people a chance to give feedback. So early feedback is good. You know, you know, early, early and often is what you want to get as far as feedback. And anything that you can do to encourage you know, constructive feedback, is, is a very healthy thing. I think most of the distributions do a, a fairly reasonable job of this, um, whether it's through mailing lists or whether it's through you know, bug trackers or, or other mechanisms. Um, distributions tend to be fairly good at listening to their to their constituents, listening to their users, and then trying to address their concerns. But that's something obviously we can all improve on is, is, is listening. I think there's a reason that we were born with two ears and one mouth. I thought there's supposed to be some meaning in that. I haven't figured out what it is because I'm too busy, too busy talking. But um, there's, there's, there's feedback mechanisms. Right? So now that I've gone through this exercise of what is a distribution and why do we build distributions and why are they important and what are the things that they, that they bring to the table, let me ask the question of why. Why do we buy it? Why do we go to all this work? Because it's fun. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a very good reason. Some of us, we must get some satisfaction out of this or we wouldn't be here, right? So yeah, because it's fun. But I think there's, there, there's a fundamental reason why we, why we do this. And a fundamental reason why it's so important to work with upstream communities, to, to be a good citizen, to, to take an active part in, in software development. And I think this sign really sums it up. It's the best sign I could find to describe it. It's that we all live downstream. Like every single one of us is, 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 a, is an end user of some sort of Linux distribution. Either, either you've rolled your own, or you're using one of the ones that, uh, that somebody else is working on. But we all live downstream. Just like you wouldn't go out to the, to the street for, for motor oil down the, the storm drain. I hope nobody would do that. You know, we, we certainly don't want to, to poison our, our, our software development communities by, by our actions. And so we all live downstream. We all want a better environment. We all want things to be better you know, than we found them. And so this is, I think, the fundamental reason why it's so important that we, that we build strong relationships with them, upstream communities, that we stay actively engaged with those upstream communities and try not to surprise them. Um, I love the saying that engagement is the exact opposite of surprise. If we stay engaged, if we stay focused, if we stay communicating with those upstream communities, we won't be caught off guard by their changes and they won't be caught off guard by ours. Anyway, that's, that's uh, what I had to say as far as a prepared talk on, on upstream and, and distributions and why it's so important. I've left a few minutes for, for questions. So feel free to ask me questions either on this or you know, Fedora things or, or other things I might know about. I'm happy to answer your question. Question right here in the middle. Um, you mentioned earlier that you try to aggressively push patches upstream. What I'm curious, how, what do you mean by aggressively? And uh, what happens when upstream ignores it or rejects it? Huh? The, 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 the idea is to, is, is to make sure that we, we give it to the upstream community in as good a shape as we can, explain why, why, we're, we're, why we're using that patch, why, why we think it's a good idea to go upstream. And then if the upstream wants it, that's great. If they don't want it, we, you know, we'll probably keep it around as a patch in our in our in our packages. Um, obviously, we want to try to build you know, lines of communication and dialogue between between the groups. So, to take Asterisk for example. Um, if we're if we're packing, packaging up Asterisk in Fedora, we have probably I think we've got seven or eight patches against Asterisk right now. We try to not only just open a bug report with Asterisk, but talk to people and say, hey, this is why we're doing this. Is does this make sense from a from a broader view? Might this might this benefit other other distributions? as well and try to you know start those conversations. It's not always an easy thing to do. Sometimes the upstream is just like, nah, not interested. I'd rather go shopping, you know, whatever the case may be. But at least we've given them a chance and we tried to try to explain 
um, while we're doing the things the, the, the way they're doing. It, it's, it's not all the ch changes are going to go upstream. Sometimes they're just not not a good fit. But at least we've tried to make it better than, than, than we found. If, if say upstream rejects something, do you try to promote something cross distribution wise? So at least you know. Sometimes it, 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 it really depends on the package and the individual packager. I mean, some of that discretion is up to the packager. Of you know, I know in, in, in Fedora, for example, we have many packagers who are, are good friends with the packagers from OpenSUSE or Debian, and, Ubuntu. and so they say, "Hey, we're using this patch. Is this of any interest to you?" Um, and then there's some sharing that goes on. Probably not enough of that, but, but there is some sharing that goes on. Um, but it's very, it's very dependent on, on individual packagers individual maintainers to, to, to do that sort of work. There's probably not enough formalized structure to try to share some of those things. Hopefully, hope, hope, yeah, hope that's a good question. You. Okay, question right here. As I say, just a comment from upstream, which is which is where I mostly live in, in my work, mm -hmm. open source work. Um, you know, we get a lot of good packet suggestions good fixes from some of our downstreams. Uh, sometimes, sometimes they're great, get in there straight away. Other times they come at a, just happen to come at a bad moment when no one's got time to look at them, but we'd love to look at them later. Mm -hmm. And uh, it can be great if people realize that and, uh, and give us a nudge too. Right, right. And again, I think it's about building a, a relationship of trust there where, where you're involved enough in that upstream community that you feel like you, you, could, you can share things or if things aren't happening, you can, you can feel like you can give that nudge without being you know, rude or without being <laughs> inconsiderate. Um, and I think that, again, that, yeah. that comes with building a healthy relationship between the upstream and the downstream. The ideal situation is if you have a developer who is the packager, who is also a member of the who's, upstream who's team. Who's also a, a member of the upstream team. That's, that, that is important. Not always easy to do, but th that is important. Absolutely. Also, it depends on the effect distribution. Uh, in Ubuntu, you've got no single meeting of the package, which right. I think is a bad thing, but that's their decision, of course. Yeah, but it also makes it very hard for them to communicate with us. Yeah, yeah. There's, there, uh, there's obviously a difference between the different distributions and how they handle packages. And, you know, we'll, we'll work through some of those issues. Question, question over here at the end. Um, so uh, a lot of this comes down to the packager and to how he behaves against upstream or maybe people reporting bugs against this package. Right? Mm -hmm. um, is there any way that uh, Fedora tries to take care of packages and uh, especially packages that are unmaintained or do not have a, a maintainer who is very angry? Sure. So there's, there's several things we do inside of Fedora. Um, which I'm most familiar with for um, for trying to try and to address those concerns. The first thing we do is that that we try to make sure that we have at least one person for every package who's the package the primary package maintainer. Um, and we have packaging guidelines that, that that try to set forth this is this is what you should do. This is what you must do as you build this package to try to encourage. Um, good, good behavior with upstream. We also have a group of people within Fedora who we call proven packages. People who are able to go in and, and apply security fixes and, and, and help out with packaging. Let's say a maintainer is on vacation or a maintainer um, decides he, he doesn't have time to, to, to take care of his packages at a given moment. These proven packages can come in and, and kind of help out and, and kind of fill in the gaps for, for, for individual packages may, may be busy or, or, or may fall down on the job. Those are a couple of mechanisms that we use to try to, to, to try to deal with that. In, in the most extreme case, we have a process for a non-responsive maintainer so that we can you know, try to get their package reassigned or, or, or alert them to the fact that there's bugs that are, that are out here not being addressed. And Debian has that too, for example. Yeah, Debian has that too. Is it, is it also true that uh, in the Fedora community uh, that there's uh, a small issue with uh, Package reviewers, that, that packages sometimes take a long time to be reviewed or patches. Um, they, they sometimes package. The question was, is there a problem, a small problem in Fedora with sometimes package reviews taking a long time? Um, and the, 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 the frank answer to that is yes. Sometimes it does take entirely too long, and it's entirely too much of a painful process to do that. It's always this trade-off between giving people, you know, the flexibility they need, but trying to hold them to, to, some, to some level of accountability and some standard, and be, having some consistency across the package set. So yes. Um, 
the, the way the package reviews handle, are handled in Fedora is, is very ad hoc at times, and it's very, hey, I'm trying to get somebody to review my package. Won't anybody please review my package? And you really have to almost depend on somebody being interested in that package or knowing enough about the, the particular domain that uh, that package is, is a part of to, to really do a thorough review and, and understand what it is to review. I mean, I can, I can review all kinds of Java packages, but uh, am I really the best person in the world to, to, to you know, that's really qualified to be even have any clue what the, what that Java package is doing? Maybe not. So yeah, it's, it's certainly room for improvement there, absolutely. So do you think there's any way that you, as a community, that you can do anything about it to improve it? Um, there are. Um, one of the things that we've, uh, that we've encouraged is is um, swapping of reviews. And so like on our mailing list, we, we encourage people to say, hey, I'll do two package reviews for two of your packages if you'll do two, two package reviews for me. So that sort of thing. Encouraging people to, to do package reviews. Um, every time we have a, a FUDCON event, somebody says, hey, I'll do 10 package reviews for a t-shirt or a beer or whatever the case may be. Um, so there's I, I, you know, ways, to, ways to bribe your way into, into package reviews. Obviously, that doesn't scale real well outside of you know, you know, you know, meet space conference. But uh, um, yeah, there's there's different ways that we, we use to try to encourage people. Obviously, proven proven packagers um, are great go-to people for, for packager music. They say, hey, I can't get anybody else to to, to, to be interested in, in, in reviewing my package. You can usually nudge one of the proven packagers and they'll, they'll do it. Just one question. So this is enough for me with the door. What's the package review your kid second? What's the rule? The, 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 the package review is to review the spec file, make sure that you know just, follows, just, just follows for, the packaging guidelines. I mean, it's just for people who are not part of the project to upload, be able to get something in the archive. Is that it? No, it's, it's actually people who are who are in in the Fedora project and are packagers in, in the Fedora project. They still need to have their packages oh, right. reviewed by someone else. No, no, no single person can all by themselves push a package in and say, "Yeah, it's ready to go." We always, we always do peer, yeah. peer peer review uh, right. of packages to make sure that they. That they're, you know, that they're saying. All right, got a, a couple more minutes here, it looks like. Um, other questions, comments, complaints? Rotten tomatoes. Funny jokes. Yeah, I have perfect software. My head of world still works the best it can. That's awesome. <laughs> I hope I hope in ten years or fifteen years when the when the C compilers have all changed and everything I'm assuming it's in C. When the compilers have all changed and everything that, that, that it still works. C compilers well, changed in such a way that any hello world apart from new hellos um, <laughs> sees functioning so that something's very, very wrong. Well. Uh, you know, you know the the best analogy I can use for that, and I've used this one before, is that um, if, if, let's say you have a daughter, and your daughter comes to you and said, Dad, I want a pony. What's the first thing that comes into your mind? You're like, oh no. Where am I going to put the pony? What am I going to feed it? I'm going to have to clean up after it. It's just going to be a mess. Okay? Why don't we take that same approach to software? Too many people say, well, I wrote the software and it's done. Software is a living, breathing animal. You have to feed it. You have to clean up after it. Every once in a while, you have to take it to the veterinarian. Heaven forbid you never have to put it out of its misery. <laughs> but software is not static. Software is, isn't just a block. You, you, you build it, and then it's done. Because things change. Operating systems change. Development libraries change. Requirements change. Power supplies die. Hard drives die. All these things, all these things happen, and, and and so I think again, trying to take the, the longer term view of, of, of software in general, you know, think think of it more as a, a living, breathing animal, where rather than I wrote the code, it's done, I never have to touch that. Again. I guess the you know, and the flip side of that coin is if it's worth writing, it's worth writing again. So sometimes, you know, sometimes you just rewrite. Um, I've just got another question. Um, from my point of view, it's much easier for a community uh, which consists of a lot of upstream developers as well as Fedora uh, is, as Red Hat as a company hires a lot of upstream developers uh, to apply changes uh, than for the distribution uh, which consists of less upstream developers. Um, so it's always easy for a project like Fedora, which consists, I'm, all, I'm not sure how many upstream developers Red Hat hires, 
overall, but it's uh, quite a large number, um, to say, hey, help uh, <coughs> the upstream. Um, let's take a look at the, the recent uh, problem, for example, Ubuntu has with uh, GNOME Shell. They tried to put some changes in, and maybe they didn't did it the right way either. I'm not involved, I was not involved there. Um, but uh, that led to a total split off and uh, let them fork to their own desktop environment. Um, so from my point of view, it's always easy to motivate if you're in, the city in such a glad situation as Kedawa is. Um, obviously, I'm not, I'm not up here to point fingers and say, oh, this, this person did this wrong, or this team did this wrong, or this community um, did, did this wrong. But you know, there, there, there certainly is something to be said for, for you know, not just having a distribution that packages upstream software, but is really active in those upstream communities and works with them. That's not to say there's not going to be differences of technical opinion. You know, pe people in, in, you know, in this room, and certainly in, in, in free and open source software, are smart people. And anytime you get enough smart people together in one place, there's going to be technical discussions on is this the right way or is this the wrong way. Sometimes there's going to be juvenile discussions that's going to point out, are you right or am I right? You know, but, uh, but there's going to be technical differences, and that's okay. That's a very, like, like I said, as long as we can remain civil, as long as we can you know, act like adults, that, that's a very healthy thing. Again, it's, it's what sets us apart. Um, but yeah, being, being involved in those upstream communities is, is, is key. That's not to say there aren't going to be forks, there's not going to be splits, there's not going to be differences in opinion. And, and, and to some degree, that keeps everybody on their toes and is a healthy thing. Again, the world would be a very boring place if everybody thought exactly like I do. And if we all take that attitude, I think that, that helps us along the way. So in some ways, the diversity helps, you know, helps keep everybody on their toes and, and, and gives us all something to, to, to work for and make things better. Keeps us from being complacent. All right, I think we have time for, for one, maybe two more questions. We have to have a clear line between upstream and downstream. Or should we just blur the line and say that if somebody packages for some project, they are actually working on the project. So it's a blur line that says that if we are patching the upstream project, we are also working on the project like as if we were upstream. And this is a blur line between a packager and it's, somebody working on it. It's, it's always going to be a blurry, blurry line exactly where that is. I think some distributions have a, have a pretty clear, you know, clear definition of if you're coding for this particular software, then, then, you're, then you're upstream. If you're just packaging, then that's downstream. Other, other distributions, it's, 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 it's more of a gray area in between. Well, is documentation, you know, if you're working on documentation and pushing that upstream, is that upstream? Is that midstream? Is that downstream? I think, personally, I think in, in any case, whenever you're doing uh, work on, on a package, there's, there's always going to be some upstream work anyway. Sure. And, and sometimes, in my case, one, one section eventually ended up taking over uh, upstream maintenance for, for one of the packages that I was maintaining. So I think the line will always, like you say, be blurry and sometimes even completely disappear. Um, but it also depends on the upstream project. If, if you're talking about a very large upstream project, it might not be easy to be part of the upstream team there. And, and, and yeah. Exactly, and so it just it just depends on the project. But the, I think the key point to take away is not you know is it upstream or downstream or where's that line. I think the key thing is forming those relationships with the upstream community so that they're not surprised by what you're doing and you're not surprised by what they're doing. That 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 shows some level of engagement or, or commitment to that community. There's enough communication going that you're not surprised on on one side or the other. Because no, no, nobody likes surprise, right? If you're a packager and then suddenly upstream does something that totally catches you by surprise in your package, that's never fun. And if you're pack, pack, you know, by, by, by the same you know, token, if you're upstream and, and, and the downstream packager does something that, that really surprises you, then that's, that's no fun either. So again, avoiding surprises there makes, makes all the difference. All right, one last question, if anybody's got one. Going once. Going twice. All right, sold to the highest bidder. Um, thank you for. Thank you for coming to FOSDEM. I've got my email address up here. If people have other questions, uh, catch catch me out in the hallway or, or drop me an email offline. I'm happy to help out. Thank you.